you probably know that Akash Pizan is a year ago, almost exactly, on um, data mining the Pacific Northwest. Akash has done a tremendous amount of work, and uh, we know that from before coming here, you already were writing a paper uh, with me. You're very thorough, and so it's very uh, detailed on the future extraction piece, but what uh, you will see from, uh, I guess, really a big body of work that uh, happened over the past year is a really comprehensive view on machine learning for uh, event classification in the Pacific Northwest. And so, yeah, go for it. Uh, thanks, Marine, for the very detailed introduction. Um, so, hello, everyone. I'm Akash. Um, in this Seismo Lunch presentation, I'm going to uh, give a presentation about something that I've been doing for the uh, past few months now, uh, unraveling exotic seismicity in the Pacific Northwest using machine learning. So um, I will start by taking an example of a massive landslide that occurred in, uh, in uh, somewhere in the British Columbia region. Um, it's uh, it's located at this Iliad Creek, Iliad Creek slide, which is located around 250 kilometers northwest in Vancouver. Uh, this is a massive landslide, and it happened in uh, November 2020. Um, let's uh, look at the location where this happened. In this picture, you see a lake, a glacier, and a bunch of uh, exposed terrains. Uh, these are highly unstable. Uh, this glacier called Granville Glacier used to extend all the way until this point. Uh, in the past, uh, past uh, in the last uh, uh, ice age, and due to deglaciation, which is further accelerated by climate change, this glacier is rapidly retreating. And as it's rapidly retreating, it's exposing this uh, unstable rock terrain. So we will look at the same picture, but from the opposite angle, the location where the slide happened. So in this picture, there is the same lake, Elliot Lake, and this is the slide phase, and this this debris fence. So this was a massive landslide. And to give you an idea of how big it was, imagine uh, dumping 25 million car from the height of 600 meter in this lake. And uh, due to this massiveness of this landslide, this, uh, this landslide caused a huge tsunami, about 150 meter uh, high waves. And this tsunami turned into debris flow that then flowed into this way. And here is the destruction that this massive debris flow caused. So once this uh, once this area was covered with dense forest, and now it's just the debris flow deposits. So I took this particular example for starting my presentation because uh, despite being the largest landslide uh, in the Pacific Northwest in recent few times, one of the largest. This landslide remained undetected, unnoticed for at least three weeks. After that, uh, Dr. Goran Ekstrom, who is a seismologist at Columbia University, in his uh, routine uh, analysis of seismic signals that are not generated by earthquakes, he found some signals and he he was the first one who discovered the land uh, who discovered the signal coming from the landslide, but it's really a collaboration of a, a geodetist, a geologist who ultimately figured out where this landslide was. So this example shows the potential that we have uh, in uh, we have uh, for seismic uh, for seismology uh, in characterizing the surface events, and then we have uh, for any landslide or any surface events we have some general questions like what triggers surface events? Um, we have a very rough answer. Uh, we know the pore pressure changes in the subsurface mostly causes landslides. Um, this pore pressure change can be induced by the rainfalls or by the earthquakes. But then the question is uh, how much duration, how much intensity, how big should be the earthquake, how close should be the earthquake? And then 
are surface events occurring more frequently due to climate change? This is uh, one of the uh, important question that we need to figure out, uh, especially in times like uh, today. Are there any seismic precursors that uh, accompany surface events? And can we build early warning systems? Now, uh, we can ask similar questions for earthquakes as well. Uh, and we have much better answers for earthquakes compared to surface events. Um, the reason we have much better answers for earthquake is because we have a very well defined catalog for earthquakes compared to surface event catalog. So the one way to answer all the questions that I asked in previous slide is to develop a reliable surface event catalog, which should uh, at least contain these things, origin time, location, magnitude, and duration. So how can we build a reliable surface event catalog? So uh, there can be many ways to do this. The approach that I am using is based on machine learning. Uh, let me let us uh, look at the current state of monitoring. So the current way by which the uh, exotic events are uh, surface events are labeled in the PNSN. So PNSN uh, mainly focus on earthquake monitoring and surface events are bycatch of that earthquake monitoring. So uh, seismologists look at the seismograms coming from several stations and if they notice something that does not look like earthquake and is coming from the mountainous region and is shown on the several stations have emergent character, uh, after all this investigation, they label surface events. Uh, they do not go uh, find details, whether it's coming from debris flow or rock fall or rock avalanche. They just label all these uh, events as surface events. Um, so we have, uh, based on this kind of uh, monitoring, we have over 9,000 events in the current surface event catalog that PNSN has uh, developed. And we don't know any other information about this uh, catalog, about the events in this catalog, other than the time of detection. Also, uh, this is the figure from my colleague Yu's paper. Uh, this just shows the temporal evolution of the surface events in the catalog uh, compared with the temporal evolution of the Comcat events. Now, Comcat events are the earthquakes and explosions in the USGS uh, event catalog. Uh, one noticeable thing here is the drop in the surface events between the time from 2004 to 2008. Uh, this is because uh, during this time, um, Mount St. Helens erupted um, and uh, seismologists were very busy analyzing the volcanic seismicity and also the, the signals generated by surface events may be overshadowed by the signals uh, generated by the volcanic seismicity. But my uh, main point for showing this slide is uh, that we are missing a lot of surface events in this catalog. Uh, this is not a complete catalog. Uh, it's uh, We need to repopulate this catalog. So uh, the approach that I envision uh, could be something like this. So we have uh, waveforms from several stations and we run a continuous window. And as this window runs through the uh, waveforms based on its source type, uh, this is what I envision. And how will I achieve this kind of thing? So I will, I'm trying to use the supervised machine learning approach. Supervised machine learning approach can be of two types, um, classic machine learning and deep learning. So classic machine learning, uh, the difference between the two is that classic machine learning involves an intermediate step of feature extraction. So we use uh, the raw data and we extract some sort of uh, characteristics, uh, mathematical descriptions. Uh, in deep learning algorithm, the features are extracted as a part of algorithm. And we don't know the specific meaning of the feature, it's just all within the algorithm itself. So uh, let's talk about the classic machine learning algorithm. What do we need to develop such a machine learning models? So the first thing we need is a labeled data set. Second thing uh, we need to do is uh, we need to extract features from them. Once the features are extracted, we need to tune our machine learning model. 
and train our machine learning model. And once the model is trained, we, we will uh, we will uh, test it on the unseen data set and we will get the resulting labels. <clears throat> so let's talk about the label data set for uh, this uh, mission. Uh, we have the label data set uh, that is compiled by my colleague. Uh, these are the events in the PNSN catalog. We have a event uh, catalog that contains over 150,000 events. And uh, you can see these uh, events are mainly distributed in four categories, earthquakes, explosion, noise, and surface events. So earthquakes form the majority of this catalog. There are about 9,000 surface events. And the noise is compiled by selecting the windows that arrive before the P, P, P arrivals of the earthquakes. So noise is compiled in that way. <clears throat> In the next uh, figure, there's it's the geographical map that shows the extent of the earthquakes, uh, magnitude, and depth. So they are very well distributed geographically and in terms of depth and magnitudes. So uh, second step is feature extraction, and I will. Uh, this is uh, what I've, I've been particularly interested about. <clears throat> in classic machine learning, uh, uh, in in the papers I surveyed. Uh, Scientists, a lot of scientists that use random forest uh, model or classic machine learning are going for uh, discrimination of different type of seismicity. They use a particular set of features that they have developed on the basis of their experience on what uh, characteristics separate different sources. So they use this particular set of 60 or something features. Uh, I will show an example of these features. These are duration, P by S, amplitude ratios, energy ratios in different frequency band, uh, rise time, things like this. So I extracted the same set of features that people in other studies have uh, extracted. I call these physical features because they are uh, based on the physical characteristic. And then, um, Features can also be extracted by the help of a predefined feature extraction package. So I use uh, this uh, feature extraction library called TSFPL that extracts over 300 features. And I think I'm the first one that uses TSFPL in the seismology, but it's been used in uh, many other domains. Uh, the main point is uh, it extracts a lot of features in temporal, statistical, and spectral domain. So here are some examples of the features in the statistical domain, in the frequency domain, and in the spin. So I extracted this set of features as well, over 300 set of uh, 300 features. And then I also extracted this uh, set of features. It's uh, called scattering network. And it's becoming very popular, uh, especially specifically for unsupervised clustering. Uh, this is a complicated figure, but uh, in essence, what happens is uh, these are the raw waveforms, and we apply, uh, we multi, we convolve these waveforms with dip, uh, with the wavelets in the different frequency bands, and we get the wavelet transform, and then we apply another uh, wavelet convolution on this obtained wavelet transforms, so we get second order transform, and then we stack them, and these are considered as features. Um, these are uh, popular because of their robustness to the noise and shifting. So I extracted all these three set of features. And then the next step is to decide which machine learning model to use. So there are so many classic uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, I tested the most popular ones, uh, six ones. Um, and uh, what I found for each set of feature, this is the general trend that is observed. And uh, you can see these three algorithms perform the best. Uh, this is XGBoost, this is Light GBM, and this is Random Forest. All these algorithms have one thing in common that they are uh, tree-based algorithms. They involve uh, ensemble of trees. Uh, XGBoost performs the best, but the computation time that it takes is about 200 times compared to the Random Forest. So given that the difference in performance is not very significant, I decided to choose random forest model for all my subsequent investigation. Now, uh, this uh, using random forest model and extracting three set of features, I just uh, compared, computed the accuracies. And accuracy is basically 
how many predictions were correct. So uh, this is the trend in the performance that we obtained for different set of features. So this is scattering network, physical, TSFL, and then I combine the TSFL and physical. And then I also added some manual features. Now, what are these manual features? So manual features are the features such as hour of the day, day of the week, month of the year. These features are added to further improve the performance of machine learning model, uh, thanks to Alex's um, suggestion. The reason this works is uh, because these are the hour of the day distribution of different kind of events. So explosion mainly occur during the daytime and uh, machine learning model can use this thing to further refine their classification. So I added these features and we got we get the best performance uh, for all sort of models and when I use all these features. Now, uh, this is trace wise accuracy so basically i'm uh, i have a trace or station and i'm classifying each station uh, i these are uh, event wise accuracies so basically i am uh, for each event we have multiple traces and i am averaging the uh, i'm averaging the uh, the mean probabilities and then i'm assigning the labels yes talking about accuracy maybe um what, who labels the reference? Uh, PNSN. Okay. And PNSN, and Snow Avalanche, what are your labels? Uh, my labels are earthquakes, explosion, noise, and surface events. So this is the accuracy for, for these four labels? Yes, these four classes. Yes, that's true. <clears throat> um, so these are the event-wise accuracies. So these are the better uh, estimation of performance because I am um, averaging the probabilities. So for, for each prediction, the model assigns a probability to each class. And then I'm averaging the probability in each class across the station. And uh, based on that average probability, I'm selecting the maximum to give a class to a particular event. So we get an increase in performance when we consider multiple stations. So the left ones are the trace-wise accuracies, the right ones are the event-wise accuracies. And then uh, accuracy does not give entire picture of the performance because uh, the classes are heavily imbalanced. So if there are 94 earthquakes in 94% of the data is earthquakes and my model predicts everything as earthquakes, then we will still get 94% accuracy, right? So the much better uh, estimate of performance is precision. Precision is uh, how, how much precise is my model. So out of 1,000 events that are labeled as earthquakes, how many uh, events are actually earthquakes? So uh, one thing, some things you can notice in this figure, uh, different color represent the precision for different set of features. Precision for explosion is really low, around 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And uh, same precision for surface events are relatively low compared to the precision for noise and the earthquakes. Another thing is the huge difference in the precision for the physical features and the, that have been used in many previous studies and the TSF features that have been using in this study. So there's this massive difference, especially in terms of surface events recognition and in terms of noise. Physical features perform slightly better uh, when, uh, when, uh, uh, when uh, considering the explosion, but in other cases, they perform worse than the TSFL features. Now, these are the trace-wise precision results. Event-wise uh, precision are much better. They jump to 0.5, and uh, they perform, they jump to perfect one in all the other cases. Um, so the overall conclusion is uh, TSFL features perform much better than, uh, much better than the physical features. And when we consider the results of the several station and when we average them out, we get much better results. Now here's the confusion matrix that shows uh, where the model is confused. So the main confusion that is occurring is between earthquakes and explosion and surface events and the noise. So the diagonal, all the elements should be in the diagonal in this confusion matrix. The, uh, this, uh, Vertical axis represent uh, the labeled event, 
and the horizontal axis, uh, uh, axis represent what my model predicted. So ideally all the elements should be in the diagonal, but you can see there's a massive confusion between the explosions and the earthquakes. And there's some confusion between the surface events and the noise. And this, uh, this shows the feature importance. Um, feature importance, uh, by feature importance, I mean the features that were most important in discriminating the different classes. <clears throat> so the ones in the blue are the TSFL features and the ones in the red are the physical features. And uh, they both, they both uh, appear in top 50. So it's uh, not entirely that the TSFL feature dominates the feature importance. Both feature sets contribute in classification. And here is the number of features versus performance graph. So I'm basically using a uh, cumulative number of most important features and computing the performance. And it shows that about 100 features are required. We don't need to use all the features. We can do the achieve the same performance by using the top 100 features, which is uh, very important when we consider the monitoring. Here is the distribution of the most important TSFL features. Uh, basically, what it represents is the values of the features and the classes. So different uh, different colors represent the classes. So one thing we can notice is TSFL features are very good in separating the green from the red, but they are poor in separating blue from the yellow. So the green and red are the surface events and noise, and blue and yellow are the earthquakes and explosions. So TSFL features are relatively poor when uh, talking about discriminating earthquakes and explosion, but they are really good when uh, considering the discrimination of surface events. And these are the distribution of the top uh, physical features. They are really good in separating uh, blue and yellow or comparatively good than TSFL features, but uh, they can't separate the red from the blue and yellow. So they get confused between the surface events and earthquakes and explosions. Uh, I also uh, used the deep learning exploration. So I tested a lot of uh, deep learning architectures that uses single channel models. <clears throat> so I, I surveyed a lot of previous studies and I picked the models and uh, I tuned the parameters uh, until we get like very good results. Uh, so uh, I tested basically four architectures and uh, these are the curves that shows uh, training and validation loss. So ideally both loss should be decreasing. Uh, if they don't decrease, that just indicates that the model is being overfitted. So I basically change the architecture until we get a nice decrease in the validation loss. Um, this is just uh, just to show that I, I consider the deep learning part as well. Uh, here is the final graph that shows the performance of the classic machine learning models, the one with the circular dots, and the plain, uh, the, the deep learning models, the one with the plain bar graphs. Uh, these are the accuracies. Uh, usually classic machine learning algorithm based on uh, considering all the set of features perform better compared to the uh, deep learning models. Uh, this is the precision. Uh, the classic machine learning has a very good advantage in terms of explosions, in terms of recognizing surface events. Uh, in noise and earthquakes uh, discrimination, they have almost uh, similar performance. <clears throat> now, another use of classic machine learning is that it gives us the ability to recognize potentially mislabeled events in the catalog. Um, the reason that there might be mislabeled events in the catalog could be uh, that a lot of events, they occur in the same place, same region, and they have very similar waveforms. Uh, the reason I consider these waveforms as potentially mislabeled is because my machine learning model, which is trained on all the data set, uh, it classified the waveform with very high probability into other class. That means my model is very confident that they should belong to other class compared to the class they are labeled with. So here are the examples 
uh, that are labeled as explosion in the catalog, but my model consider them as earthquake. And then we have a probability by which my model considers this, them as earthquake. Now, uh, here are the misclassified explosions. Now, one interesting thing is these particular waveforms, which I will zoom in here, uh, they are labeled as explosion in the USGS catalog. In the PNSN catalog, they are labeled as earthquake, and my model labeled them as earthquake. Uh, the reason behind this could be that the USGS did not update. Um, Alex might more uh, tell you more about this. Uh, but all these uh, waveforms, we uh, we took these waveforms to PNSN analyst, and they also agree with what my model says. So uh, it's a good way of cleaning the catalog as well. Uh, these are the earthquakes that are classified as explosions by my model with high probability. And these are the noise that are labeled as noise, but my model thinks they are surface events. Even though they may not be surface events, but they are definitely some kind of events other than noise. Um, and then, so I I uh, I defined my catalog. I can I uh, took all these uh, misclassified events that are misclassified with high probability, and I removed this from catalog and I retrained my model. Uh, then we get increase in performance. So these are the without refining, and the ones with the lines are the uh, are the results produced by the refined model. So you can see a substantial increase in the explosion. Uh, accuracies and uh, for noise it is one and a substantial increase for the surface events as well. Uh, most importantly, most importantly, when we consider event-wise results, we get perfect one, perfect performance for each class. And considering their F1 score, which is a, a multiplication of precision and a, a geographic geometric mean of precision and recall. So we get perfect performance for each class when we train my model with the refined catalog and we consider multiple station in the results. So this is significant. Uh, this was my model. It performs well on the data. Uh, we removed the misclassified, potentially mislabeled events. We determine the best set of features. Now it's ready to start action. It's ready to come through continuous data set and start identifying surface events. Um, so this is uh, my detection phase. Uh, I'm just uh, trying to show a glimpse of what I'm doing. Uh, these are the 400 surface events that were detected that were not in the catalog my model was trained or tested on. Uh, these were the ones that were detected later. I tested my model on this uh, and uh, it found 380 as surface events, one earthquake, one explosion, and 15 events as noise. And here are the waveforms it considered as uh, explosion and earthquake. Um, these are the single station results. I haven't applied it on multiple stations. But when I looked at the noise waveforms, they were actually very noisy. But this is pretty good. This is like 95, 96% recognition. And then uh, I also test my model set uh, from this four station. So each line is basically a window and uh, the color represent the label it provided to that window. So the green color represent the noise and the red color represent the surface event. And the blue color is for earthquake. Um, and the red stars are the probabilities that, uh, that it, but it belongs to surface event. So you can see, uh, so this, this, Wes was talking about this particular event uh, and there are more events there. So you can see wherever there is an event, the surface event probability rises up. And uh, when there's uh, noise, it does not detect that well compared to the green stations. But it's working very well. I'm also exploring a lot of uh, other data set. Um, and I'm, I've been running it for a while, um, but uh, that will be a story for another Seismo lunch. But yeah, uh, this is the results. Main takeaways are TSFL feature performs significantly better than physical features, especially in the case of surface events. Uh, manual features such as hour of the day, day of the week, uh, month of the year helps in improving the performance of the model. 
classic machine learning model performs better than deep learning model um, based on the models that I explored. I'm not saying deep learning is worse. Uh, it's just based on what I've explored. This is what I'm seeing. About 1% to 2% of the events in the current catalog could be potentially mislabeled based on my investigation. We may need to clean. And removing these potentially mislabeled events leads to perfect model performance. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, this was fantastic. Thanks. Can you go back to the histogram that shows the uh, 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 which features are most important? And it looked like the first seven were absolute mean or something like that. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, is that like the absolute amplitude in counts of the trace? Um, so the wavelet absolute means basically represent that we have a wavelet, a recurve wavelet. We convolve it with the spectrogram, with the with the seismic signal, and then we take its mean in different frequency bands. So there are 10 different frequency bands. This uh, basically represents the frequency between 0.5 to 2.5. So the wavelet mean one represents the frequency around one hertz. Wavelet uh, mean 10 represents the frequency around 2.5 hertz. Um, Yes, and these these are the features that are I think are the most important uh, in the discrimination of surface events from the other events. They are good in identifying surface events. Or I was wondering if it's some of them like mean absolute deviation. It looks like they might be accounts. So I was just going to suggest that you might want to consider applying sensitivity to traces before putting it through machine learning, which is just a linear scaling of the amplitude, which translates from whatever the native instrument encounters to something mm -hmm. semi real. Oh. As opposed to doing a full sort of response to the conclusion, yes. you just try applying the sensitivity, which is Okay, yes. the question is, do you, yes. do you think it's the um, No. I, I just uh, took the raw data set, and um, I normalized each data set between minus one to one, but I did not remove the instrument response. Um, yes, I normalized it. Um, I did test it with uh, removing the instrument response, but uh, it's it's tricky. It's tricky. Um, I wasn't getting good results. Uh, I did explore that for a while, trying different uh, deconvolution parameters, uh, but ultimately I came back to without removing the response. But that involves like filtering quantification of frequency domains. They might want to try again. I see. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh yes. Um, yes. Yes. Um, that's true. Uh, it's uh, it's something I'm currently actively investigating. Uh, so, for example, this is basically a one big event, but there is noise here. So, what should be the threshold to merge this event and consider as a single event? Like, what should be the what should be the maximum difference among the consecutive events in order to consider that as a single event? Uh, that's one thing I'm um, currently investigating. Um, other thing is, uh, what should be the minimum probability threshold to consider this as a surface event? Um, what should be the number of stations on which it was detected to consider it as a surface event? Uh, so I'm I'm playing around with those parameters, and uh, obviously it's uh, still going to absolutely confirm that it's a surface event. Uh, but um, I will. Uh, we'll do. Uh, we'll do what I what we can do, and then uh, yeah, I'm also thinking of uh, including the infrasound analysis to further confirm the detections. 
And there's so other things, and I don't know if you were able to see me in some of the other areas on this particular time series where it probably would be those up. Uh, yes. It, it just dynamic range, but they're you know, so much smaller than the big ones. Deep ones, right? The initial. Uh, yes, yes. So for this, I'm uh, thinking of the uh, uh, duration criteria that an event should be this big at least in order to consider as a detection. Maybe three windows, four windows. Uh, yeah, but uh, it's it's uh, it may be caused by instrument analysis or or or, uh, or gain problem like you said, but. Uh, uh, one thing, since I am uh, using the normalized waveforms for training my model, it's very good at detecting small surface events as well. I'm not saying that a game problem. <laughs> it it's might be, it might be. Yeah. Yes. Another thing, and this is just petty, but I feel like I have to say it. There's more students in the room than other uses of our catalog, which is um, Comcat is an ANSX catalog, so it's not necessarily the USPS. Yes, yes. Um, yes so with a Comcat, they're also from us, we just haven't updated it. Oh, okay. So what we have locally can sometimes give you different information. Yes, I see. But we can upset who you buy have. <laughs> That's true. Yes, Tom. I was wondering about biases in your training data set, because I, I guess in the Pacific Northwest, like service events are like we clustered around the whole thing. The station network is really clustered around the volcanoes. Um, other stuff happens at other topographic um, features. Yes. Do you like kind of um, and ensure that this is like not overrepresented or so in the um, set? I can go deeper with detecting avalanches at Mount Rainier, but not at Mount Baker. Sure. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I, I think. Um, the surface events are um, that we have in the catalog. They are distributed around Saint Helens and Rainier, Baker. Some some are from Baker as well. So since I'm using uh, multiple stations and I'm not using station specific feature like spatial location or anything, uh, that thing ensures that it's not biased because I'm I'm just uh, using the characteristic of the waveforms. Um, and the noise, noise is sampled all are from all the random stations. Um, so the mod, the way the model is uh, determining that it belongs to certain thing uh, class is uh, is just by looking at the waveform characteristic. Um, and that uh, that waveform characteristic may may be uh, biased by the noise. Um, uh, but Yes, yes, ma'am. You always try to find bias in the catalog by collecting the spectrum. So, oh, yes. it's easy for the user to come up with the text for that obligation, make sure they are identified by pigmentation. We include that in the catalog. And by considering the padding, we have to try to find bias in the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, well, oh, there's a couple things. The only labeled events that you're currently using are service events that related to analysts like from the CNS centers. You throw away most of them. You only label some. It probably depends on the person who is looking at it. So it's definitely not a complete catalog. Yes. Even if you are. Two, that most of the service events are small and they're yes. really big people are less frequent. So even the frequency content of the ones that we have in our catalog mm. tend to be the higher frequency ones. Mm. So the, the what the really big ones like the, the one in your opening slide yes. probably has a different they, they have more energy in the mm. series as well. <laughs> yes. Um, so those are not represented. So but for me as a network person, I don't really care because for us the news is just like so much there. Yes. <laughs> it's a physical thing. Yes. I think it does definitely shows like it can be used for yeah you know, for that. And every operational network that has volcanoes within its region does have ice rock, you know, 
Yes, uh, I think uh, one another test we can uh, do is uh, we can test this model on a different region to see the influence. Um, uh, we were thinking about uh, testing it on Alaska. Um, and I also tested it on uh, the Iris Exotic Seismic Human Catalog. And it's, uh, it's uh, working very well. Around 70% of the events are detected and labeled as sub surface events. So, There's no network this entire Yes, uh, so I'm testing this model currently on the continuous data from eight stations. Uh, it does label as noise. A lot of a uh, lot of windows are labeled as noise. Um, I haven't uh, specifically used it for detecting earthquakes. I'm mainly concerning about surface events. Um, so when I, based on my exp uh, observation until now uh, it's uh, uh it's where so what was your question uh, like more clearly how does it perform when you're looking at very very large samples that have oh okay uh, so it's uh, so i'm running it throughout the day uh, i'm using a fixed window of 150 second um it does label a lot of noise but it is uh, um, able to recognize all the surface events that uh, I know occurred on that day uh, based on the verified catalog. So it was uh, able to detect surface events. Um, uh, I'm not sure about the earthquakes. Um, one thing I'm sure is it did not detected any explosion for the stations that I tested. And uh, these stations uh, were indeed away from the explosion as well. Uh, so, Yes, uh, so it does detect surface events. It may label earthquakes as noise. I haven't uh, specifically tested for that. But is it labeling? Oh, okay. Um, 
in uh, in uh, so far i whatever uh, it's detecting uh, it's some sort of event it's not noise it's some sort of event it's uh, it could be uh, th there are certain station where it's detecting a lot higher surface events but it's mostly because of the station uh, instability or station thing it's uh, detecting some sort of strange wiggles um, which uh, we can call it as a noise uh, but it's definitely uh, very distinct very specific to that station but like for normal station with uh, which is uh, present in the good condition um it's labeling the surface events as, as it should be and uh, based on the observation of the waveforms of those surface events i think they are surface events they are not, they don't look like noise yeah so getting back to the original motivation of one of the observations on say climate yes have you noticed any sort of trend change with your new search or are you just not looking at a long enough time span right now um, that you can't really tell like yes a uh, climatic driver to surface events right um yes uh, so i just uh employed this machine learning model for three months so far we have uh, we see a pattern uh, for three months based on the precipitation. I haven't um, uh, analyzed this yet. Uh, I'm planning to run it for a longer time. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm hoping to see if I can find any correlation with the precipitation, but it's a uh, work in progress. I guess one of the, another question is, um, is one of your features the day of the year that you're training? Uh, month of the year. Month, okay. yes. So it's uh, based on the assumption that surface events show the seasonality. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. That's a great work and a, a tremendous amount of it. And I think um, it's really the only way we're going to move forward. And I have a comment more, and, it, and it's more for Renata, I think, actually. Mm -hmm. it, it, let's say that this all works out fantastically along the way it seems to be going. Yes. And moreover, you can distinguish between ice quakes and glacier quakes and mm -hmm. sources on volcanoes, because I think that's ultimately where it can be. Yes, yes. Um, but what's clear to me is, I think, that it's these aren't binary decisions. It's not, it's this kind of event or not. There's a mm. probability associated. Yes, yes. You want to make a catalog. Yes. We're not a, have, have you thought, is, are people thinking about how to include probabilities in catalogs? Because that's, it's not. Well, it's, I don't know. I think in uh, these uh, monitoring networks, we still very much operate under the paradigm that it needs to be verified. verified. It's like to officially, it's like confirmed by a person, yes, it's really the same. Let me just say, so, to say that we that we use still probabilistic, we have probable explosions labeled, mm -hmm. but they're not quantitative. No, but a human, but a human yeah. said, I think so. <laughs> right? <laughs> I think that we still kind of operate under that paradigm at the moment. So the way I envision this is kind of useful is that it's, um, Pre-categorized events, and then we really just said yes, no, or just leave stuff out instead of just saying all agree. So that would only be picked up. Now, for us, we might not even really have any use for all of the glacier quake. We might still think it's a region, right? Um, the bigger the breach zone, clearly, um, people are interested in it because they want to have it. You know, that's just it. They are hazardous events. So the bigger events we might be want to know about, even automatically. Right now we don't have any way to automatically, at least at the two eleven BW, CDO is working on systems to automatically check the strip zone. But right now we can only see it after the fact if we look at half the blue zone and look at nothing. But we don't have anything in place to be able to do the strip zone. I think there's definitely use 
given the method for the work that we need to be responsible for. Mm -hmm. But uh, all the smaller stuff, we probably still wouldn't care about it, but it's going to be the outcome. Uh, it's Yes. 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 Uh, Marine, uh, uh, Marine, and uh, I am thinking about uh, locating these events, uh, and then we see where these events are located and. What are the geographical characteristics, and can we include some sort of ge geological features to further um, confirm these events? So that's a very good thing. There's one more question on Zoom. Yes. Uh, if uh, from John, John, if you're around, oh, if you can hear me, he's asking: Are there theoretical models for the spectral surface events? Oh, John, can you put this one? That's so. I, I'm here. Yes, perfect. Yeah, I, I was I was just wondering if um, there are any theoretical models for the spectra of surface events that could help with um, detection if you're using them. And for example, surface events, um, the waves from surface events have to travel through shallow attenuating layers twice whereas earthquakes don't. And so one might think that there might be some differences there that could help. Yes, yes. Um, so in this, we haven't considered uh, about theoretical models. Uh, people, um, people have uh, used theoretical models to discriminate uh, earthquakes and explosion based on the P wave spectra, P and S energy ratios. Uh, these sort of things are encapsulated in the physical features that I'm using. Um, uh, uh, other things like duration, um, energy in specific frequency bands. Uh, although uh, I, I, uh, I am not using any direct theoretical model, uh, these features are supposed to represent uh, information about the source. So. In a one in one way, I'm using it, um, but I'm not using it directly. Oh, thanks. It's a very interesting seminar. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.